whatever. Uh, well, Pomfret in that time was a uh, pretty much an agricultural mm -hmm. town, so there was a lot of people that were farmers. Uh, I recall that was I think 35 to 40 farms in Pomfret during that period. Between the 1950s and now, over 50 have gone out of business. Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, it was very much uh, dominated by agriculture. And of course, there's a little, it goes along with the feed system to that, uh, whether it's grain stores or people to have equipment to harvest for a farmer that didn't have all the equipment. Um, there was quite a bit of that. There was a gentleman, Oren Weeks, yep. and he would go out and bale your hay, catch grass and bale your hay, and do that kind of thing, or maybe even plow your field. And he would do it for several farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, my father didn't, I grew up on a dairy farm, a small farm. Uh, my father didn't um, uh, harvest hay, he bought it, because he didn't have the time or the equipment and all that. But he did grow corn. And he grew corn up above your house in that little lot out there. He grew corn there and he'd go around wherever he could grow corn. But he didn't have a corn planter, so he'd hire someone like Oren Weeks or someone else to plant the corn. Then he would harvest it. So that was the way that worked. Uh, other people in town, uh, there was a lot more people that had businesses in town and worked in town then than today. Today people are out everywhere. Uh, there was more people working in town than businesses. whether they were running a store and that, or if they were actually doing some business. I know a friend of my father's was an insurance man, so he sold insurance, Jim Burns. And um, there was uh, some of my friends, their fathers would, uh, they'd work out of town a little bit in their, in, in their endeavors. And there were people that worked out of Pratt & Whitney. And they actually you know, they'd drive their car out of Pratt & Whitney every day to work. And there was a lot of carpooling. So you say like almost everybody that you knew farmed or had something to do with farming to some degree. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm going to take you back a little further than the 1960s. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll go back to my grandfather who came down from Canada, uh, although he was uh, an American citizen. But uh, he came, he had nothing no education to speak of, so when he came to town, the thing that he did best was driving horses. And of course, you had a lot of horses in those days. So uh, he drove horses for carriages for some of the big uh, houses that were around the big estates. Um, and uh, he became a, a farmer, like you say, uh, small farm, and uh, that was pretty much the way it was. Uh, you didn't get a great deal of big farms at that point, uh, and uh, he sent milk out, uh, and it's kind of interesting the way he did it. The milk, uh, of course, had to be pasteurized, so he would put it in big cans and take it down to the train at Abington Station and uh, ship it to Hartford, I guess, probably. Uh, and, and just a little sideline, uh, my father, uh, when he went to high school, he went to Willamette High School and he rode the train from Abington Station uh, because the train schedule was better for Willimantic. If he was going to Putnam, it was, uh, it would put him in the class an hour late. What year was he born? So what he would do was he would drive the horse and wagon down to Abington Station with the milk, load it on the train, uh, give the horse a slap on the hind end and climb on the train and go to school and the horse would go home ah. by himself. <laughs> What year was he born? He might have taken a, a little uh, detour occasionally oh, okay. and <laughs> yeah, stopped for some uh, delicious grass, but uh, uh, that was the way they operated at that point. Uh, now, my father was a, uh, he studied to be a uh, civil engineer 
for a couple of years. He went to the University of Maine. And uh, then World War I came along and he was drafted and uh, sent to France and uh, uh, well, he was uh, wounded over there. But uh, when he came back, he became a school teacher and uh, he didn't really want anything to do with the farm. Uh, a big garden is fine, uh, but uh, living off a few cows and, and a little milk uh, wasn't just it. So he spent his time uh, teaching school uh, in uh, various places, but uh, mainly he spent his time teaching in Florida. Right. Hold on. We're gonna have to work. Okay. Adults. Work. Well, basically, he was a dairy farm. My parents dairy farm. Both set of grandparents were dairy farmers. In fact, uh, my mother's parents ran a little processing milk plant and peddled and sell, sold milk and delivered it around. Which is why when I got older from working on my dairy farm with my parents, I went to the University of Connecticut and took a course in the dairy product manufacturing. And eventually, when I was in my early 30s, I got a job at the University of Connecticut at the creamery. And then when they closed the creamery, I did the ice cream for three years. So I was the ice cream man for Yukon for three years. But the, say it was just a farm life growing up, all the family and the bombs. You didn't, didn't get many uh, factory farms until later on. About you know, when did that happen though? Basically, in the 50s, when this, the government required farmers to have bulk tanks. All the little farmers that had cans and stuff couldn't afford bulk tanks, so they went out of business. Bolt. So you got bigger farms then. What's a bulk tank? It's where the milk comes, after you milk the cows, it goes in this big storage tank before it's picked up. And, they, you know, and also, following all the rules and regulations the state said you had to do for a dairy farm. Did it? I feel like... I've heard somewhere where, like you said, the regulations really cracked down. The, the, and then they were, they were crazy time. You know, when they put the bulk tanks in, one of the stipulations was to have spotlights over the end of the tank so it's shining down in the tank. Well, then after you get it all in, they come up, oh, we can't have the lights over the tank because it might break and fall, so we got to move them. So, you know, it's, you know, the, the things you try to do to make the state happy, to keep operating. I lived it. I will say something that women worked hard in that time period on the farm. The women did as much work as the men uh, as far as milking the cows and carrying the milk and so on. My mother and father started, my father worked in the grain store locally and then he managed it later in life, but um, he started a farm in the late 30s and uh, he and my mother started out with a couple of cows and they ended up being like a 35 cow farm. Now what's interesting about during that, those periods, you could make a good living with a farm that size. Today you gotta have maybe 3,000 cows to try to make a living. But back then you could, you could make a living uh, with the price of milk um, and a small farm as long as you were willing to work seven days a week, uh, 13 hours a day, with two people, and there was no end to it. You were really dedicated, there's a passion, it was a lifestyle. Farming was a lifestyle, you had to have the passion to do it because it's a lot of work. But um, there's a lot of reward from being able to do all that. Uh, I remember that my father was kind of the master of working the fields and my mother was the master of what to feed the cows and care for them so they produced the right amount of milk. Uh, you had to give them the right nutrition and so on. Uh, when they first started milking, they had the milk cans, the big jugs. Uh, 40 big, quart cans. 40 quart cans, uh, rather heavy and I can remember the uh, the gentleman that used to come and take the milk away, the, the cans would be in, when they were empty, you'd put them in a big cooler tank with, with chilled water circling. Mm -hmm. And that would chill the milk and cool it in the cans. And as you would fill them up, you didn't have to lift them because they were already in the water. So when the gentleman came to pick up the milk and put it in the truck to take it, my parents' milk went to Providence, he was a pretty big guy because you've got to pick these things out of the tank, and then you've got to go, you've got to set them up in the back of the truck.
truck that had a cooler in it. So that was interesting to watch. Uh, and then as time went on, that got outlawed and you had to have a bulk tank. And those are stainless steel tanks. You see them today with people that are harvesting maple sap. Yeah. Which are, that is a milk tank that's on a farm. That's where it came from. Yeah. My father's tank, when it went away, a 300 gallon tank, it went to uh, uh, tree, tree maple sap guy. Uh, Chappie Rich has them at his place, I believe. You'll see them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, just to complete that whole cycle of farming, uh, and John talked about the regulations and so on, ever increasing, and regulations have increased in our society for environmental reasons and safety and all those good reasons. But what put my parents out of business with the farming it came to an end in the late 70s. But the ending was um, health, hard work and health was difficult. But the state came to my father and said, you have to put in a system, a septic system, for the farm. You yeah. couldn't just stack the manure. And that was a uh, number of thousands of dollars that was not reachable, so that put him out of business. So that's kind of a life cycle. Yeah. yeah. Pomfret is rather a unique town, uh, and has been from way back. Yes, we had a lot of farming, uh, smaller farms, uh, but it's also a resort town for the people uh, who had money in Newport or New York City or wherever. And that's uh, why we had so many big estates in Pomfret. So basically, you got two different kinds of people. You got those that got more money than they need, and those that work for them. Uh, you said that your dad worked for them, right? Yes, yes, uh, for a while, yeah. Uh, but you had these, the big estates, and they they weren't typically farms. No, uh, they were just pretty. Uh, but you had a lot of guys that uh, cut the grass and trimmed the bushes and did that sort of thing to make a living. And uh, farming uh, wouldn't make you a great deal of money, so very frequently the, the farmers would take odd jobs at helping with the big estates. Uh, my grandfather wound up driving a car for them. He went from horses to a car. Oh, uh, chauffeur. Yep, it was the only car he ever owned. When the uh, state manager uh, died, he gave my grandfather his car and his will. 1928 Dodge. That's a yeah. great car. Yeah, and he drove that car to the end. Yeah, chauffeurs. Uh. Like wouldn't carry go here had a, a show line of Guernsey cows. Treatly Farm Estates had Guernsey cows also, I believe. So there was a few of the big estates with farms on them. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the town was basically the family farms. And the towns the, the town was like split. You have all the working farmers out in this area, then you got all the rich people in the estates that Mainly Kanye at the top of Pomfret Hill. <laughs> That's why um, the road up there in Palm Pomfret Street was known as Pucker Street. Yeah. So, so others. I'd say the, the more wealthy people. Uh, my father's father, I'm going back too far, but my father's father uh, hauled wood to the people on the hill. The hill was referred to as, uh, I've always thought of that as the area where Pomfret School is, and up in that area, it was kind of the hill. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And to get up there was this long hill from the bottom, if you've ever driven in the car, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a team of horses hauling a load of wood up the hill was pretty tired by the time they got to the top. Uh, so my grandfather would provide wood. That was his business. Um, my father, when he was younger, worked on one of the estates, as did his half-brother and his uh, mother, who was all from Ireland. and. Uh, his half brother was the chauffeur for the family, and uh, he was—that was his job. And they had a Packard and a Dodge, and uh, Goodrich, and uh, 
uh, he would be the chauffeur and he'd take the, the, the property owner to the proper golf course to play golf and then pick him up and bring him home. And uh, my father was very younger at that point and he would take a piece of chain link fence stuff material and drag it around to rake the pea stone in the driveway to keep it looking nice. So he would drag that and his other, his other task was he would clip the rosebuds of all the roses. He was younger when doing this. And then um, they had a butler and there was a, a refrigerator but it was an ice box. It didn't have any motor, it had ice in it. And they had an ice house, of course, and um, I remember that I think it was a different, the butler didn't do this, but my father's half-brother, the chauffeur, he put the ice in the ice box in the morning, and the door you could open in the side of the estate building, the mansion, and you could put the ice in there for the day. But he couldn't do it until after 10.30 in the morning because you didn't want to risk making a noise and awaking the madam <laughs> early. I know that. My mother and father told me that they're in there farming from 35, 40 years. Uh, they made money the best and the easiest in the 1950s. They told me in the 1950s you could make a good living farming. Yeah. Before that it was a build up and after that it went downhill again. Yeah. But the 50s was the peak. Because the price Eisenhower milk, years. Back then the price of milk stayed the same. Yeah. Everything else went up. Yeah. And yeah. After a while, yeah. you're losing money. You know what's funny? Another analogy is today people talk about it, the husband and wife have to work, two people have to work to make it a good living and all that. In many settings, yeah. uh, I gotta tell you, my father worked the grain store uh, five hours, for five and a half days a week, and he ran the dairy farm. And so he was working two jobs. And my mother worked the farm just as hard as he did, and she bottled milk by hand. She bottled 40 quarts a day by hand of raw milk uh, four days a week, and she'd deliver it to people in town. She had customers all over town, they'd take the raw milk. So she had that other business. So there's the grain store, the dairy farm, and the, and the bottling of milk. There's three businesses, seven days a week, husband and wife. Yeah. So I think people work harder than they do now. But that's just an yeah. interesting comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. As a, a kid growing up on a farm, you were expected to work, you had your chores you had to do, and you had to you know, basically help do everything. Whether it was out in field work, or whether it was taking care of the cows, or chickens, or whatever you had, you were expected to work. And Neighborhood kids, they, they'd come to the farm because they'd like to be there. And Were you expected to do any job outside of work or outside of the family farm, like at any point? We kid, me as a kid, no. You worked at the dairy farm. You worked on the farm. Uh, what I did is... Uh, something different. I became a geologist, so. But uh, to go back just a little bit, originally uh, transportation controlled pretty much what you did. Uh, in the early days when it was all horses, you worked close to home, relatively so. And then as the, uh, the trolleys came in and the trains came in, you could go out to uh, a wider area and eventually you got a car and you could go to Hartford or, or uh, as a lot of people did, to New London, to an electric boat. Uh, so that made a lot of difference. But uh, World War II made quite a difference too because uh, the guys that came back had the GI Bill. Uh, and many of them used it to get a better education, uh, which means that they no longer had to do manual labor, such as farming. Uh, 
They could be engineers or uh, machinists or something. But so it made a lot of difference, uh, and I utilized that myself to um, learn a little bit about rocks, which uh, I followed up. My career was all in geology. What was your first job ever? Uh, my first job was after I got out of college, uh, a permanent job. I mean, we had a lot of lawn mowing and so forth when we were kids, but that don't count. <laughs> well, my I... first job after I got out of school was with the U.S. Geological Survey in Washington, D.C., uh, working on the geology of Alaska. So, yes. Uh, we can spread out now. Uh, we have transportation, airplanes, and uh, this type of thing. So, uh, the GI Bill made a lot of difference with that group of people that were involved. And I guess they still do, but... Uh, um, so, what you did depending on uh, what sort of an education you got, and you went into, um, into uh, dairy products, and uh, so everybody spread out a little bit more. We didn't have to work at the local green store anymore. So, Is that true for you? Yeah. Um, I had a unique way of uh, satisfying my work and leisure at the same time. Uh, I was a golfer, so I studied golfing at 10 years old at Montfort, and I fell in love with the game. So I'd play golf all day, you know, all day, with my friends, all day. And we paid for our membership by hunting for balls in the morning, and we'd sell them to the owners. So you hunt big you golf balls, you turn them in, and you could buy an annual membership and play. I think the annual membership was 40 bucks uh, for a junior. But I would play golf till dark. Then I would come home and probably get on the tractor to make sure, because my mother and father wouldn't be happy if I didn't help out. Then I, I would be out plowing the field at 3 a.m. in the morning with the lights on, and I'd, I'd do that. Um, I also did work as a youth uh, off the farm I worked for John's grandfather, Earl, picking up hay up by Big Boy's farm. I used to, I used to, used to go up there and help haying there. Uh, a couple times, I, a few times, I helped John's father plow some fields with the John Deere B. Yeah. Um, I worked for the one summer for the uh, state state uh, forest uh, state park. I worked in a state park, uh, doing things there. That was another thing you learned skills. And um, that's kind of how it went. I think um, it, I couldn't work too much off the farm because you might get a cold reception at home because there's work to be done at home also. But people, I think the youth spent their time outside and you, you did do a lot of jobs because you didn't get a lot of money handed out to you. I didn't grow up in a wealthy family. I was very fortunate. We had a very good life and had heat and food. And, new clothes to go to school every year and so on, but uh, there wasn't a lot of extra money. You had to go earn your own. Boys in the family. Uh, so the little jobs were spread around pretty well. Uh, but you did have to do a certain amount of uh, gardening if you want to eat, you got to grow something. That's uh, what it is. And uh, of course, you'd have little jobs uh, in the summertime. You'd uh, pick up little odd jobs around the neighborhood. But uh, I don't think I was ever expected to contribute to the family income. Um, you just had your 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 side hustles. That's it. Yeah. What did you do for side hustles? I would love to hear some of those. For side jobs? Yeah, like 
little ways to make like your own money for you that you were just talking about? Well, uh, it worked for the local farmers occasionally. Uh, when they would be haying or something, they would need extra help. Um, shoveling hay or when you're growing corn, uh, the farmers would uh, have a crew to cut their corn, put it in their silos, and you'd work with them, uh, that type of thing. But it was an agricultural town at that point, so that uh, most little odd jobs uh, had to do with some sort of uh, part of farming. Uh, I don't remember doing really too many uh, outside jobs like uh, that. There just weren't jobs available locally. And of course, we never had transportation at that point, so uh, you didn't uh, get a job much further than you wanted to walk to. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like side hustles are a lot more plentiful than they are than they are nowadays. I don't recall doing that, but I do recall wanting to earn some money to have some cash to do some things. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> I won't, I won't always take some money. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't have to be a lot. No. No. I remember wanting a bicycle. My parents said, well, we'll give you a little money for doing this or that, yeah, then you save it. And when you get the money for the bicycle, you can go buy it. And that's what basically what happened. Yeah, my parents promised that to me and they did not deliver. Like, like all farmers, you work seven days a week. It's, it's, uh, that's just the way it is. You can't shut the cows off. No. Uh, I know Sunday I would go to church Sunday and we, I didn't work in the morning, but my parents would take care of the cows in the morning, the morning milking. We would go to church. Um, and then after church, I can recall now that you've got my mind going here, uh, very often Sunday afternoon was um, repairing fences because mm. the cows would break the fences all the time. Because the cow gets up to this nice barbed wire fence and they look over and one blade of grass is green, they push it this way, they break the fence. So you'd have to go out and fix fences. And the other thing we would do on Sundays very often is repair the water bowls. Mm. What are the water bowls? Well, where yeah, the cows go in the stanchions, every other one has a water bowl where the water comes into it so the cow can drink. They put their nose in there and they know enough to make the water come out. Mm -hmm. Well, cows are big animals and they swing their head around, they smash the water bowls and they break them. So they break them off, the water's flowing, you gotta shut it off, and you gotta repair it with uh, threading new galvanized water pipes. Yep. So you learned, I was quite skilled at threading pipe from fixing the water bowls. Yep. And that was twice a month on Sunday you had to fix water bowls. No so there's no end to what has to be done yeah. on a farm. <laughs> no, so, yes. Okay. Start his family. You were a master for how many years? Oh, over 30. I'm, I've been a member of the Grange for over 50 years. I'm still a member. The Grange is what started out was to organize agriculture in the country, to stabilize things, to get the agriculture back on its feet after the Civil War. Now, <clears throat> the Grange is now evolved into a community service organization where you, you do projects around the area to work on improving stuff, educating the people about agriculture stuff, and organize activities for you, for adults or whatever, contests. It's, it's, a, it's a fun organization, but it's unfortunately, it's losing appeal for the public now, and it's slowly dying. I mean, this, the Grange here in this town, 2009, we folded because there wasn't enough members to keep it going. And, and now all the active members wanted to join the, the Grange in Woodstock. So there is still well, there was a Grange. They had their building there, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Strictly. Involved in the Grange in any way? I was involved in the juvenile Grange when I was in grammar school. What did you guys do? Well, it followed the regular Grange, basically, except it's set up for kids. Uh, we pretty much followed the same routine. Yeah, same contests and stuff, yeah. Yeah. 
And what you probably don't know is that uh, I happen to be a Mason, and the Grange follows the Masonic doctrine. Yes, a lot of this secret work is about the same. That's where it came from originally. Yep. The, uh, the Masons, of course, have been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. And uh, whoever set the Grange up apparently was a Mason and wanted the, to follow The seven founders of the Grange were Masons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the juvenile division, Yes. Was it just like that, or was it more catered towards the youth? Or did they keep that same kind of structured style? We had the same officers. Okay. Uh, and it pretty much followed the regular range. Yeah. 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 Something that comes to mind about social leisure activity in town, and I may not get this right. I forget that it was an annual event for years in the, I guess, 40s, certainly in the 50s and beyond, a little bit. Um, there were two fire companies in town. Abingdon had a fire truck. It wasn't much of a truck, but it was under the, uh, with a, uh, the old uh, grammar school, uh, elementary school in Abingdon. Across from Worcester. So the, there's the, uh, it's the building now, they do some manufacturing there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's right next to the uh, Abingdon store. In the lower door of that uh, basement, that's where the fire engine was stored for Abingdon. And in Pomfret, there was a similar size fire truck, and it was stored in the firehouse uh, where the house is for sale there, that purple house that was a gift shop and so yeah. on, right across the gas station. That was the fire company was in the back there. And there would be a competition. I don't know whether it was for 4th of July or Memorial Day or something, but the two fire companies would get together in a very festive setting, and a lot of people in town would come and join and watch, and they would compete. And they competed against each other with fire hoses, so they'd have their rubber suits on and hats, and they'd just blast the hell out of each other with fire yeah. hoses to see which team would quit or say, I'm done. And then they'd have a tug of war with the rope. We all know what a tug of war is. And it would be interesting because some of the firemen that were more portly were maybe up at the beginning of the rope. Mm -hmm. And there was never one Pomfret Center or Pomfret Proper or Abington. It was never one that always won. It would go back and forth. A different year, somebody would win. And that was a big community event. I recall that. I was in the fourth grade at that time, <clears throat> and they let us out early, a whole hour early in the afternoon. And I can remember running home, running, because the wind was blowing real hard, and the trees were crashing down all around. Um, it it uh, blew very hard for a while. And I remember that uh, the house we lived in had a, a porch on the front, across the front of it. And the wind was lifting the porch up. And I can remember my father putting a rope on it out there and trying to tie it down to something. And all of a sudden, whoof, it went out of his hands, flew over the top of the house into the lot over and back. Your porch? Our front porch. Oh. Uh, my mother was overjoyed. The room that was in back of that porch was always dark. Now there were light in it. <laughs> yeah. My dad wasn't too happy. Yeah. Uh, but that was, uh, the hurricane was kind of unexpected. They didn't really tell us. I guess they knew that there was a windstorm coming, but they had no idea it was going to blow that hard. And it, it did a lot of damage. Yeah, it, it really it, knocked down a lot of trees. Yeah, and it, it took the steeple off the church. Yes. In Abington. Yeah. The roof off the parsonage out there in 44. And it ended up by the cemetery something. Yes. Yeah. It was really something. My mother told me a story about she was, she had a new baby, my oldest sister, in 1938. And, uh, she was looking out the window and hearing this roaring thing. And uh, my father was delivering grain up in Eastford, and um, uh, 
she talked about you being very fearful what was happening and he wasn't home she was kind of distraught there but there were trees flying around and so on and my father was delivering grain um, which is now route 244 going into uh, up in almost at the east border and the trees started falling down and they fell down so rapidly he couldn't move the truck and the winds were coming up and he was going to walk to a house down the roadways and he couldn't walk because the wind would blow him into the stone wall. So he had to crawl to the house. <laughs> and um, he got in there and he stayed the night. Then the next morning he had to come back home to his bride. So he had to walk. Couldn't walk in the road. It's full of trees. There's nowhere to walk. So he'd go out in the woods and climb over a tree here and there and so on. And he walked from Eastwood back to Montford to get home. And it took him like all day. Because yeah. we just couldn't walk along too many trees down. So. And his brother told the story, which is a true story. Um, some of my stories aren't true, but this is true. Uh, his brother was at the Brooklyn Fair. So they're sitting in the grandstand and some events going on, and the wind started coming up, and they were getting concerned, but they were still continuing. And my uncle told the story of this chicken coop came flying through the air and landing into the arena. And that's when they realized this is really getting serious. Yeah. Mm. And he had a tough time getting home. And he had an old Chevrolet, which was like a 1933 or something. And in order to get home, he was going, had to go somehow through Danielson. And he remembers in the main street, there was a building roof collapsed and the car was caused to drive up on the roof and over the other side to continue on. But he finally got home. But the destruction was just unbelievable. How long did it take? To bounce back like the kids. That's what's amazing. Today we have chainsaws, cranes, we got everything in the world. I think thing was pretty well corrected within 30 days, maybe, to be able to, to move along. And they did it all with hand saws. Roads, yeah. All cross cuts, two yeah. main cross cuts, no chainsaws. And, and they, they cleaned it up. You know why? People work together. Yeah, there were little sawmills all around, yes. sawing up all that yeah. timber that was down. Yep. Yeah, but that was amazing that this all physical labor to it. No cars could probably mm. haul things like that then. No, there weren't big they... trucks. I mean, a, yeah, the truck was a small truck. Yeah. There weren't big trucks. Yeah. No. Yeah, so you guys make it sound like that didn't happen often. Now you talk about the floods of 55, uh, there wasn't a great deal of wind with that. No, it was all rain. And it really didn't bother Pomfort too much. It took out a bridge or two, I believe. Took out the, the two bridges on Pomfort Landing, and the one on the main road and the river road. Were Across the Quinnebog. Yeah, they were gone. <clears throat> the water was up to the second story of the Blue Victorian there, Pomfort Landing which was a dairy farm run by Howard White. Howard White. Howard, funny old guy, kept the cows in the barn to the water up to the back and they had to swim them out. Yeah, the water was up to the second level. On second the level, end. yes. Yeah. My, my father, well, he took us down there. We were supposed to be down there. Nobody's supposed to be down there. But took us down and somebody had a boat and he hopped on the boat and took a ride out and crossed this unbelievable amount of water down there. How long did that last? I mean, water lasts for yeah, a lot long. Two or three days. Well, it receded fairly fast, yeah. but it wasn't. It was a long <clears throat> time for it to just go away because yeah. it was so deep. But the water was quite impressive. I mean, the <clears throat> tunnel the Mash Market goes through under the airline trail here, the railroad trail, is 30 feet high, 30 feet wide, and 150 feet long. That was half to two thirds full of water, all upstream from the track. It was a huge lake out there mm -hmm. on that flat land. It was it was unbelievable amount of water. So that river that cuts through Putnam, Quinnebog. How much of that that I see now today? How much of that was there before the flood? Well, um, there's a there's a there's a Bridge Street. Yeah, Bridge Street Bridge. The Bridge Street Bridge. You know, um, there was a car dealer there. Um, Russ King and yeah. Greg King just sold the business. They was they had their garage there, yeah. and that got totally, totally destroyed. Yeah, Greg King told me they had to start up somewhere else with the yeah. car. 
God. There was a construction company that my father's brother uh, worked for, Medbury and Trowbridge, and they had big dump trucks and bulldozers and things. And right where the Price Chopper store is in that uh, market area, there was the North Main Street of Pop Putnam, and that's where the construction company had their home base. They had six large dump trucks, and when the flood had finished, there was only one dump truck left in the yard. And the other ones went down the stream almost a mile past Manahasset Village. The water just rolled them mm. down through town. And I was staying in uh, <coughs> East Putnam with my aunt for a few days. She had a younger boy that was near my age, so we were sort of hanging out there. And I couldn't get home because of the river. I couldn't get across yeah. there. So it, I got home. It took me 24 hours or more to get home because my uncle finally came and got me with a dozer. He was working in town. And we went across to Quinnebog the day later in the dozer. And the dozer was underwater. It was up to the seat. It was, the exhaust was up mm. in the intake, and we actually went, yeah. uh, a diesel engine can run underwater. So we actually were, that's how we got back. And just about all the bridges on the Quinnebog were wiped out. Yeah. With the exception, though you couldn't get to it because it had washed out both sides of it. The one in Putnam, there by the falls, that bridge was still there. Though there is pictures of the water going over the top of that bridge. My wife lived in Putnam, and um, one of the big impacts uh, to people in Putnam was, um, uh, first off, everyone had to get a typhoid shot. It was like mm -hmm. a pandemic yep. inoculation for uh, typhoid, so everyone had to go get the shot and they lived in town. And they didn't have water. There was city water in Putnam. They didn't have any water that was drinkable, potable, because it was all contaminated. Yep. So she lived on Walnut Street, and the whole street would go down to Mr. Whittemore's little farm and get water out of the well, and he'd let them do it because there wasn't any water. Mm. Now in Pomfret, all our water mains are okay because right. we didn't have any. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and when the uh, mill that had the magnesium barrels started oh, yeah. warming up, I remember at night standing out back at the my parents' farm, looking at the sky lighting up from the barrels blowing up. I think people thought the world was coming to an end yeah. with that. They didn't know what to expect. Well, it was terrible. Yeah. That must have taken all the power lines down, too. I don't remember too much about that. But. Oh, I would think so. Yeah. 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 Oh, another story of local interest. Um, there was a family that ran a store in Manahasset Village, which is at the south end of town, and it was totally second floor. Right. Let me 12 feet of water. Wiped everything out. And Rookie's Market was there, yeah. and that got totally destroyed. And that's when the Rookie family came up here and started the store up here. Yeah, they bought it from the The 55 Pompeii. hurricane destroyed them. They came up here. Yep. Mm -hmm. The newcomers. The newcomers, yeah.